Maya is the author of three extraordinary works of non-fiction. We are old friends. We actually met in this building, uh, working on uh, uh, three books ago for, for both of us. <laughs> I on the last Mughal, I on the White Mughals, you are on Edge of Empire. Um, and uh, since then, we went off travelling together, looking at archives of uh, strange archives uh, in Savoie, where uh, late Mughal manuscripts and uh, the records of Claude Martin and, uh, and de Boyne and all these extraordinary figures of Indian history had ended up uh, next to a fountain of elephants in Chambéry. Um, Maya is, is from a sort of unbeatable uh, uh, academic genetic background. Not only does she have both a father and a mother who are full Harvard faculty, uh, and one black sheep of a brother who's at MIT, uh, she's half Bengali and half Jewish. So there's absolutely nothing that uh, can beat her uh, in, in any sense. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of the ultimate intellectual cyborg that you're, we're faced with here, uh, before which we have to just bow down and give up and uh, hand over prizes and, and glittering, uh, uh, glittering trophies. Um, Maya um, has been extremely brave and far-reaching in her research. Uh, unlike some of us who tend to sit on the same patch and produce uh, books from the same sort of area and the same sort of type, both in terms of form, in terms of the, the scope of her books, uh, and in geographical and temporal reach, uh, all three of her books have been about very different places, very different times. Edge of Empire, her first book, was about art collectors and the collecting of empire uh, between uh, India, Egypt, and the Middle East. Second book uh, was about uh, the, uh, the, the American Revolution and the forgotten loyalists who had to leave America uh, after, the, uh, after the Patriot victory uh, and disappeared off to strange corners of the globe, including India, but also Liberia and South America and all sorts of places. Uh, and then fun suddenly we, we, we find this third book uh, emerging out of the heart of Europe um, with the extraordinary figure of Conrad, who's, uh, I've, I've told, what, how do we pronounce the, the real, his real name? Yusuf Theodor Conrad Korzhenyovsky. Korzhenyovsky, uh, known better to all of us as Joseph Conrad. Uh, and the book, as I'm sure most of you sitting here will be aware, received rave reviews across the board from left and right, um, and was one of the most chosen books in the Books of the Year last year. Uh, and it tells an extraordinary story. Uh, what I think sort of made it remarkable from page one is that one of the problems of literary biography is that they tend to start off very slowly. However, bohemian and revolutionary your subject's middle, year, uh, middle years may have been, um, Literary biographies tend to start off with rather boring school days and, uh, uh, and, and, and sort of anecdotes about head teachers and this sort of thing. Uh, Conrad's life, however, genuinely starts off in the middle of a sort of spy story uh, with his father, uh, a leading uh, Polish patriot and writer, pulled off by the Tsar's secret police to, uh, what was it called, the, the high security prison? The Citadel. The Citadel. Uh, uh, into which uh, he, he, was, he was thrust. And Conrad, uh, as a child's earliest memories, uh, are of his father having been disappeared uh, into this fearsome political vacuum. I think we could do worse than starting with a reading from that early part of the book. Sure. Uh, um, and uh, since, maybe, uh, let open, well, since we're yeah. talking about scene setting, let me just say a word also about... Uh, about where we are right now. Um, as Willie mentioned, he and I have known each other now for, I think, 18 years this fall, uh, having met here. Um, and in that time, um, uh, we've, we've both written lots of books and done double acts all over the place, but here we are back at the beginning. First time here, yeah. And yeah. indeed, and, uh, and William, as many of you will know, of course, is the author of many, many celebrated works of travel and uh, history and is a model for me, among many other uh, historians, um, but also uh, this festival is something that William has, of course, had a huge role in. It started in Jaipur. Many of you will probably know about the scale of the Jaipur festival, and now um, it's wonderful to see this whole other sort of dimension of your uh, your talents uh, really coming into its own in this little uh, little spot of neo-colonial uh, or reverse colonialism. I mean, in the in the center of the British Empire, writes back exactly. The Empire writes back. Wonderful. Um, so, 
so the book uh, that I've written is about uh, Joseph Conrad, who, um, again, we know under this very English name, Joseph Conrad, and we know as one of the canonical writers in the English tradition. Uh, but what we also need to know about him is that he was, by birth, Polish, uh, and born into the Russian Empire, the Tsarist Empire, at a time when Poland itself did not exist on the map of Europe, having been uh, carved up by rival empires of Prussia, Austria-Hungary, and Russia, Poland did not exist, and, and the young Conrad, or Korzeniowski as his surname was, came of age thus as a very self-conscious uh, subject of empire. His parents, uh, again of Polish uh, extraction, speaking Polish at home, steeped in a Polish literary tradition, were also committed Polish nationalists who were determined to reinstate a Polish nation uh, and rebel against the Tsarist authorities. And it is through this series of revolutionary activities that Conrad, as a very little boy, maybe three years old, is taken to Warsaw by his father, by his mother, and um, his father is trying to start an underground uh, newspaper to help foment revolutionary activity when there is, in the middle of the night, before the newspaper rolls off the presses, a rap on the door. And this is when the Soviet, or Soviet, <laughs> there are many resonances between Sorry. that period and now, uh, and subsequent periods. The Russian authorities, the Tsarist police, come storming in uh, and whisk him off uh, to the citadel. So I'll just read a bit uh, at Willie's uh, uh, suggestion uh, from uh, this early part of Conrad's life. Eva, Conrad's mother, Eva's mother uh, rushed up from Berdichev, his hometown, to help. She may have looked after Conrad when Eva went every day to the citadel, joining a crowd of women massed at the gates, seeking word of their jailed relatives. Every day they were refused. Sometimes we stand there a whole day in rain and cold, waiting for a short note, for some news, and sometimes we wait in vain. Once, to get warm and to pass the time, we counted ourselves. We were several score more than 200. The crowd kept on growing as the arrests continued. Priests, rabbis, pastors, quote, people of all estates and wealth, age and situation, among them several women, unquote, all locked away behind the blank brick walls. Unable to see her husband, Eva pumped the guards for updates about Apollo's health. She delivered clean sheets and food for him, and after much lobbying, was allowed to give him a prayer book and Robertson's textbook for learning English, quote unquote. At 10 day intervals, she was permitted to write Apollo a short note. If the censors approved it, he got to read it and write her a line back. Christmas Eve, 1861, two months after his arrest. Letters for Apollo had been piling up at home, gifts from friends and relatives, prayers and blessings. Eva made her way through the city's sad, black, and silent streets for her daily visit to the fortress. She found the citadel compound, as usual, crowded with prisoners' relatives, patient and impatient. In the last month or so, Eva had finally been allowed to see Apollo a couple of times, in five-minute snatches through a tight wire mesh, with guards on both sides, guards in ordinary uniforms, guards in fancy uniforms, guards in no particular uniform, all of them shouting not aloud when anything of substance got said. Eva and Apollo used their allotment laughing and joking because, quote, the sight of tears is not liked, unquote, and besides, it was better to keep their spirits up. Today would be different. As a holiday favor, families were to be granted the chance to meet briefly without offense between them. Eva peered around shawled shoulders and scarved heads to spot Apollo coming out. There, there, was that him? He looked so thin, his face blotchy, his beard like a clump of burrs. Across the invisible line of freedom, they clutched hands. They broke a sacramental wafer, blessed by a priest, and prayed. Conrad had just turned four. Much later, he would recall that, quote, in the courtyard of this citadel, Characteristically for our nation, my childhood memories begin." Unquote. So Conrad is, is born into, a, into already a very fraught political and patriotic atmosphere. His parents then get sent off literally into exile. 
describe the, the place they were sent to and, and, and the, the, his formative memories. Of yeah, that. so after this period locked up in the Citadel without a trial, uh, Conrad's father, Apollo, is uh, found guilty on charges of sedition and so on, and he and Conrad's mother are sent into exile um, into uh, about a thousand miles east of uh, Moscow, um, Moscow, Warsaw, excuse me, about a thousand miles east of Warsaw. Uh, and it's deep into Russia. I mean, it's sort of on the way to Siberia, sort of gateway uh, to Siberia. And they're, you know, they're in this uh, very small community, but community of Polish fellow exiles and political prisoners. But this is their life. They're living in this place far away from any kind of home and family connections and so on. Uh, and it's also a very sort of difficult climate. It's cold, it's wet. Uh, and, uh, it, it, and unhealthy. It, and unhealthy, exactly. And so under this sort of, uh, you know, as it were, both psychological and physical hardship, both of Conrad's parents end up falling very seriously ill with tuberculosis. Uh, his mother dies uh, in this place to which they're exiled. Uh, the father is unable to uh, carry uh, young Conrad to a slightly different place of exile, still in exile, where he starts becoming more and more ill and is also, I should say, plunged into a really deep mourning and grief. And Conrad is raised in this really kind of traumatized environment with a father who's essentially psychologically completely distant from him. So through all of this, Conrad is coming of age. He gets shunted from uh, uh, one schooling situation to another. He has private tuition. His father then ends up dying. Uh, and by the age of 11, Conrad is an orphan, uh, educated henceforth. Uh, has to walk behind his father's coffin. Yes, exactly. So he ends up, uh, his father has at this point just moved back uh, to Poland, to Krakow. Uh, and Conrad also will later write of this uh, funeral procession where his father was at that time a you know, regarded sort of man of letters in this Polish nationalist romantic tradition. There's this cortege that walks through the streets of Krakow. Conrad is a little boy following it, henceforth alone in the world, in a sense, but for the patronage of a maternal uncle who will pay for him uh, to have his schooling uh, henceforth. And uh, in, in this landlocked Central Europe, as far from the sea as anywhere in, in mainland Europe, he dreams of becoming a sailor. Yeah, well, of course, what would you do, right? I mean, here you are, stuck in this situation, bereaved, psychologically uh, you maimed. Know, maimed. Yes, it's, a good, it's the right word. Uh, physically sick, Conrad is also not very well. Um, and, uh, and so what do you do? Well, you imagine of getting away as far as humanly possible from all of this. And so Conrad, fed, of course, on a diet partly of adventure literature and so on, imagines that what he really wants to do is go to sea. And the miracle of this is that after a certain amount of persuasion, his uh, ultimately very doting maternal uncle actually agrees to send him. Now, I think that the uncle probably agrees to send him, thinking that Conrad will get on a ship and get terribly seasick and not like it at all, and then come home and be the accountant or whatever it is that his <laughs> uncle thinks he ought to be. Um, but then the, the, the third miracle in this is that Conrad actually goes to sea on a French ship. He goes to France because he speaks fluent French. The Polish community, uh, there's a sort of diaspora in France. He goes to sea on a French ship, and he actually sticks with it. He goes on another voyage on a French ship. He works his way up uh, into the, you know, starting right at the beginning, swabbing the deck and so forth, you know, learning the little bits and pieces and gradually making his way up. Uh, and he does this for several voyages going out of Marseille um, until he runs into a rather different kind of block there. And it's one that I think uh, bears particular noting uh, in the present day uh, climate of Europe, which is that as a Russian subject, which he still is, uh, uh, you know, in terms of citizenship, um, he is not able to sign on to French ships without getting permission from the Russian authorities. And so he runs into this kind of Look. immigration slash labor market problem in a moment when the place in Europe where you can most easily find employment if you are uh, a foreigner is Britain. And it is through this set of channels, through the fact that the immigration is open and through the fact that the British merchant marine at this point is fast uh, and, and uh, fast expanding and has become the largest in the world, that Conrad then makes his way uh, to what will be ultimately his home but of first, England. But this, uh, a wobbly moment in Marseille. Yes. I mean, I should say that, you know, it's an interesting thing when you... Um, 
you know, you mentioned at the beginning this thing about biography, right? Which is that when you write a biography of somebody, you're sort of, you're, you're usually drawn to them because you're interested about something in, your, in their life, but then you're kind of committed to all the rest of it and all the kind of dull bits. And, um, and I, I was, it's, it's one reason that I never said I was writing a biography and I never felt that I was writing a biography. Um, and it was only kind of late in the game that I began to realize, wait, I actually am writing a biography. It was a sort of stealth move. Um, and I think part it's, of it is because... It's, it's I mean, formally it's a very interesting book because it, it isn't just a biography. It is, it is partly a travel book. It is partly literary criticism. Uh, and it is a sort of fantastically hybrid form that isn't quite like anything else. Well, and I think, you know, on this note, I will say that my own sort of impulse for writing about Conrad, I am a history professor, so my training is as a historian, um, interested in narrative, so I was interested in fiction, I was interested in sort of getting under the skin of the past by uh, getting at it through the lived experience and through the imagined worlds of the past. But I took in a way as my... Um, sort of motto, this line from Karl Marx, which is that men and women, not that Marx ever said women, uh, men and women make their own histories, uh, but not in conditions of their own choosing. And that is really the line that I'm sort of trying to, to trace through this book. So, so this thing about Conrad coming to Britain to be a sailor. If you read a little potted biography of Conrad, of the kind you'll find in the front of a novel or something, right? It'll say, you know, he spent all of these years as a sailor in England, et cetera. And you don't really stop to think about why circumstantially that might be so. And so I spent a huge amount of time pouring through the, um, the statistics of the merchant marine, like tonnage of ships, number of ships, who's on them, et cetera, to try to reconstruct this picture through which it then suddenly became clear why Conrad was getting on the ship. But then we come back to the biography because there is a person at the center of this and it is a person whose early psychological life I've mentioned a little bit about already and whose early psychological life in a sense culminates in this moment just as he's about to, uh, well, he doesn't know yet he's about to go to England. While he's in France, he's trying to get on these ships. He's having a hard time getting on the ships. Uh, he's meanwhile blowing through all the money that his indulgent uncle is sending him, uh, and his indulgent uncle sends him money, but also sends him all of these chastising letters about what he should do with it. And, and uh, this extraordinary moment in Marseille. Yes, and so yeah. then he ends up uh, in a state of great financial and, I think, psychological desperation, um, borrowing money from a friend, going off to the casinos in Monte Carlo to try to make it back. Really not a good idea. Not a good idea. He's not a good gambler. He loses everything. He comes back to Marseille. He invites his friend over for tea to confess that he's lost all the money. And before the friend comes over for tea, he takes out a pistol, points it at his chest, and pulls the trigger. Now... And is discovered by the friend in a pool of blood. He's discovered by the friend. I don't know about a... Well, there must be a pool of blood, right? There must be a pool of blood. Um, he missed his heart. Um, the friend telegraphs the uncle. The uncle comes, finds that Conrad has missed his heart. They spend some time talking about what to do next. And it is within weeks of this moment that Conrad then comes to England, jumps ship, and makes his way to London. So I think we can't understand the transition without also putting into the picture this person who is looking for ways out and for ways to reinvent himself. Maya then has a fantastic section on, uh, on this early London that to me was certainly a revelation as I've always grown up thinking, uh, and as so often in, in, in uh, this image of Victorian uh, Britain, of, uh, a place of, imagined London as a place of repression, a place of, of deep conservatism, a, a place of empire. Uh, and yet this is a place where Conrad finds a kind of liberation and which he finds is free and open to him uh, and which he finds bubbling with immigrant and uh, a migratory and uh, a cosmopolitan background. Uh, in a sense, the very o opposite to the image that we often have of Victorian London as being this closed, dark, Dickensian, oppressive place. It's, it's open, it's international, it's cosmopolitan. Yeah, I mean, I think that we can have, yeah, I mean, I think that it's important for us then as now, I mean, in thinking about then as now, to sort of hold in mind competing realities, right? I mean, London is the capital of an empire. It is particularly, as a, a, toward the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century, being uh, uh, overseas, the British Empire is becoming... Uh, more and more uh, militaristic, expansionist, uh, violent, jingoistic. Uh, restrictive, jingoistic, and racist. At home, 
in London, at least in the last few decades of the 19th century, there's a city which is more than just about any, uh, I think more than any really in Europe, open to outsiders. Open because of immigration, which of course also some others are, Switzerland, France, etc. Open because it does not have a sort of secret police and spy network to anything like the extent that you will find in some continental European nations at this time. And open because it is economically booming and prosperous. And so Conrad is one of tens of thousands of continental European immigrants coming into London uh, in this later 19th century period. Now, over the course of the time he's here, he sees this stuff change. But when he comes in, uh, it's a place where this foreigner can come and become. He lives in Stoke Newington. Uh, he lives uh, in lodgings. So that one of his friends there is a German. They become friendly. Uh, you know, the German ends up being best man at his wedding later and so forth. Um, he uh, anglicizes his name gradually. Uh, he takes on British uh, citizenship in 1886. And he also advances through the British Merchant Marine, which is open to these outsiders. He goes through the series of exams that you take, and he makes his way up to becoming a master in the British Merchant Marine. And this is, in a sense, the same experience that many Indian immigrants discover in London, that they, that they have a degree of freedom uh, and the proximity to white British people that they can't have in the colonized in the colonized empire. Yeah, I mean... Gandhi and so on go back uh, to India and find it much more repressive and restrictive than, than the life they've lived in, in, in London. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question about how, uh, you know, how, how does the same person experience belonging and difference in multiple locations, right? So, I mean, Conrad does not face the kind of experience that Indian students, for example, in this period will be facing. That is, he's white. Uh, and he's not a subject of the British Empire. Uh, and so in certain ways, that gives him access. In other ways, though, what will happen, and this is, again, why we need to hold these multiple realities in mind, what will happen at the end of the 19th century going into the early 20th century is that, in particular, uh, as numbers, large numbers of Eastern European Jews come into Western Europe, make their way to the United States, uh, xenophobia mounts. Um, it's also brought on by various forms of economic competition. And interestingly enough, in the early 1900s, the first ever uh, Aliens Act of modern British history is passed in 1905, and it will place restrictions on, on uh, immigration of various kinds. But in the debates surrounding that, people will say, oh, Indians working on our merchant ships and so forth, we can trust them because they're British subjects. It's the Germans, the Poles, the, the French, all of those people that we have to be suspicious about. So these lines, you know, we think these days a lot about uh, racism, and rightly so, and Conrad is obviously a white man in a city oriented around you know, white men. Uh, on the other hand, we also have to think about the ways that foreignness and belonging play, and in certain ways, Conrad will always be a foreigner. He will always speak English with an accent. He will always be self-conscious about that accent. He will uh, always feel and be treated as somebody who is uh, a, an outsider who has adopted this country uh, in many ways with great satisfaction on both sides, but with a little discomfort too. And in, in the book, you, you, you show very beautifully how his experience from this early part of his life is later drawn on at a much later period for the secret agent. Yes, I mean, I think uh, one of the challenges that I faced in writing a book about Conrad is again one of these biographers' challenges, which is that if you march through a life, you have a lot of stuff that happens, and then you have for an author a whole sequence of books, and normally you kind of go through the whole thing chronologically. One of the things that instantly becomes clear when you read Conrad and read about his life is that there is even more than uh, for many other authors, an incredibly close connection between Conrad's lived experience and his novels. And he would often stress those connections, uh, point to uh, real world sources for his fictions, et cetera. And this becomes and a so major strength for him as an author because it, he has lived a life Absolutely. And experience things that very few other authors. Yes, have. And, and as Henry James, who was the great kind of doyen of literary Britain in the late 19th century, said, you know, it's a great line. He says, No one has known for the purposes that you know, you know, the, the world in this way. And uh, he's right. So, so I found myself in this kind of interesting problem of having to figure out how to write about the books in relation to his life without wanting to just do the very conventional let's march all the way through chronologically. And I found that 
uh, what, I, what I ended up doing uh, was matching up the books that are based on different parts of his life with those moments in so his we, life. So the so secret we start agent. with the secret yeah. agent, even though it's a much later book. It's one of his, you know, sort of mid-period later books, but I felt that the se it's in the secret agent that you can see him working through a lot of these issues about uh, the political communities of Europe, about the uh, nature of London. It is, a, it is a deeply kind of Dickensian book, very self-consciously so. Conrad was very in influenced by Dickens, his images of London that he arrived with were Dickensian. You see him sort of working through that. And you see him working, I think, with a family story of a kind that you don't find in his other work Dickens very much. Dickens rarely writes about the immigrant community in the way that Conrad does. That's right. And so this is what I think Conrad brings to English literature. You know, he brings this a set of outsiders to the inside of his fiction. And all of his books teem with outsiders. these people who are outsiders. Yeah. You know, one thing I also was struck to... No one of, is at home in Conrad. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, because Conrad is not at home, and, and arguably, I do argue this, the world in which he lives is one in which people are getting sort of shaken up. Another thing I found, you know, early in my study of this is that Conrad's novels, so you know, we think of him obviously as a premier English no uh, modernist novelist, not one of his novels uh, is set in a British colony. And the ones that are set in Britain, such as The Secret Agent, feature these people who are by and large outsiders uh, one way or another. So the central characters of The Secret Agents are either continental Europeans or sort of have European strains in them. Verloc, the central character with a French name, French extraction, etc. And then we head out eastwards to Singapore, to the Straits, to, uh, to Borneo, where there's a whole other range of experiences, with him now becoming rather a senior uh, naval figure, uh, running his own ships, or, or number two, or number three on a... Yeah, so Conrad, uh, in, as a career as a sailor, he spends 20 years of his life as a sailor, right? So it's by his, his late 30s only that he begins to publish. He has a whole, he has at least a couple of lives, you know, before he gets to writing, and I should say for anyone who's a budding novelist, you know, it's never too late, and you can do it in your third language. Uh, so, um, so he goes off and sails a lot in Southeast Asia. Um, again, there are some sort of economic and, and, and geostrategic reasons for this, but for Conrad himself, what it means is that he's um, sailing preeminently in a, in a maritime arena, first of all. I mean, the Malay archipelago is a, is a maritime world in the way that, of course, Britain is an island. And, you know, so there's a, he's in this, this area with a lot of uh, cultures coming together, Chinese, Malay, Arab, Indian, uh, uh, all sort of milling about in this region. Um, he comes to uh, work on British ships, but British ships which are themselves manned, often by as many as half a crew who are continental Europeans of one form or another. And he, for the first time uh, in Southeast Asia, will end up working uh, on uh, steamships that go up rivers. And one of the differences between uh, working on a steamship on a river and on a you know, sailing ship at sea is that on the steamships on the rivers, you encounter the people on the banks, right? And so it's going up these estuaries in Borneo that he runs into another sort of breed of uh, uh, kind of outcast or, or not outcast, but sort of marginal uh, or, or out of place kind of figure. And these are European traders who have sort of settled uh, in these Chinese Malay communities. Um, and will feature very significantly in his fiction. And you make the point that this is, doesn't just provide background and, and context and, uh, for, for the novels. There's also the sensation of him being part of a, a technology which is being lost. He's a, he's, a, he's a man of the sale. He's used to clippers. He's used to, uh, to, to all, the, all the business of rigging and, and ropes and all that. And suddenly steam is beginning to come. Uh, and and he, he's out of a job increasingly. He, he's... He's part of an old world that's losing its grip yeah. technologically on the forefront of things. As we live right now in the digital revolution, we're, of course, acutely aware of what happens when one technology displaces another, and we're acutely aware, um, though, well, I hope our politicians are a little more acutely aware of it, of the people who are displaced by these forms of, uh, new, new forms of work. The late 19th century actually witnessed somewhat analogous things in the transition from certain forms of natural, uh, 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 nature-powered movement, you know, for example, horse-drawn carriages and so forth, and sailing ships to fossil fuel uh, 
uh, driven transportation technologies. Uh, and Conrad thus lives through a technological transition that is, I think, uh, you know, rather similar in feel, at least, and for the workforce, uh, to the ones that we have today. And so he ends up a man of the sailing ship in an era of steam, and he is extremely um, skeptical of what the new world of steam is going to be like. You know, it's a time when, of course, like now, there's tons of boosters who are saying, oh, look at how fast this is, look at how great this is. The world is going to change. We're all going to get interconnected. There's going to be world peace. It's all going to be fantastic. And Conrad looks at this and says, wait, you know, here's what you're calling progress. And what I'm seeing is that uh, not only is this kind of technology changing, but so is a whole way of life. And, and he, he comes in his fiction to romanticize the sailing ship as the kind of ideal community. Now, it is a you male community. You have quite a lot of fun with that yourself. In the yeah, yeah. All this, give us some of your, your uh, the lovely um, uh, naval jargon that you use. Well, there. I feel <laughs> silly. If there's any sailors in the room, then they'll know all of this. I'm sure, but, I'm sure know, they're all land lovers. Look at them. They're, they're, they're booking. <laughs> they've never been in a boat, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, he has to learn all of this stuff, which I also learned by reading the manuals that he would have read, you know, about all of the, I mean, of course, there's the whole watch schedule. There's, of course, all What's of the different the, the lines. Watch. Huh? The, the dog, dog watch. watch, the dog, dog watch. watch, yes, uh, uh, which is the thing that breaks up your time on a, on a day at ship. On ship, it, it's four-hour watches, and then there's one two-hour watch, and it's what throws it off for the next day, so you, you don't do the same 24-hour cycle uh, over and over again. I'm going to try and find the, what were the other words? Um, the dog watch, there was a... Well, you're particularly excited about... Uh, this, you, you <laughs> I got very excited about I this. Know what he, I know what he likes. He likes the fact that uh, when you... So one of the uh, customs in seafaring uh, for centuries, I think, in the West was that whenever someone crossed the equator for the first time on a ship, crossing the line, there would be this sort of... Often there'd be this kind of ceremony on the ship, uh, kind of, you know, boisterous, roughhousing sort of thing, and you would be kind of baptized by a King Neptune and seawater and, you know, lots of drink, lots of rum and so forth. And the word for someone who had then crossed the line as a shellback uh, from... A polywog, was it? Yes, you're a polywog before and, and a, a shellback. Shell <laughs> uh, so this book would increase great, your vocabulary. Yeah, beyond. there's some great language in there. And in all this, you sort of paint... Conrad as a sort of forerunner in many ways to all of us, in that not only is he living in a world that is being rapidly changed and outmoded by new forms of technology, he's also a sort of proto-globalist, that here's someone for the first time whose worlds are coming together, different communities clashing, migration, and so on. Yeah, and again, I repeat the sort of through line, which is that we need to hold these two things in mind, right? I mean, here is a person who is a product of and a witness to a step change in globalization, a word of course, that he wouldn't have known that we use today, to mean this kind of increasing interconnection uh, uh, across continents and peoples and so forth. There's escalations in the speed of uh, transport, of communications, of migration, etc. He's a product of it. He's the outsider looking at things. He, he's, a, he's the migrant, etc. At the same time, of course, he is someone who prefers the world of sail to the world of steam. He's somebody who romanticizes a certain kind of small community in a kind of William Morris or Ruskin sort of sense of craft. Uh, he's somebody who is, of course, a white man in an era in which uh, the world is becoming increasingly uh, ordered around these jingoistic priorities of, uh, of white men. Uh, and he brings to the page, I think, a remarkably international assortment of characters, while at the same time giving it to us through the perspective of these white men, albeit somewhat marginalized. So he's a person who, I think, forces us to think about the contradictions in our own world, right? A world in which, you know, you can advocate for you know, free migration, for example, but you will also see that protections for workers get eroded. You know, a world in which you can be at once uh, a, an outsider and an insider, depending on uh, the, the spot in which you're standing. And I think this is a really, for me, this was a very important lesson from Conrad. You know, rather than write him off as a, as a conservative exclusively or see him exclusively as some great visionary, I think we need to understand these to be in relation. So then, as a man of sail in an increasingly steam-driven world, he finds it more and more difficult to get employment in Britain and has to go to Belgium uh, and opening up a whole new phase of his life, which sends him to Africa. Yes, so the journey that he is best known for today, uh, which inspired his now today best-known novella, Heart of Darkness, was a journey that he took in 1890 to Congo. 
uh, it was uh, a job which he got, as you say, because he was squeezed out, interestingly, in the British market. The steamships are taking over. He's a man of sale. He's not really able to get the kind of gig that he wants. Through a series of connections, he ends up getting a berth. Not enough for your sell back. <laughs> it's not enough. It's not enough being a certified master in the British Merchant Marine is the real thing, because there aren't that many jobs at the top. Uh, and they're taken up by people with better connections. So he ends up doing something very different in his career, which is that he signs on for a three-year contract on a river steamer going up and down the Congo River in Central Africa. And he himself is quite daunted by this. His letters written before taking off, he talks about buying guns and Wellington boots. Well, he buys lots yeah. of, yeah, I don't, the guns aren't so much a part of what he takes, although it is a part of what a lot of other people take. But he's going away for three years. You know, this is a different kind of thing from before. Um, and he's going into a place that he has no experience of. And frankly, at this time, very few Europeans do have an experience of because uh, this is the period of the scramble for Africa when Europeans are racing into the European continent, trying to grab, uh, European, African continent, trying to grab as much as they possibly can in the most uh, exploitative terms. And one of the many um, sort of deeply unsettling kind of, uh, uh, I don't even want to say really paradox, and sort of hypocrisies of the place that Conrad will end up in, the Congo Free State. Is is that it builds itself as a free state. Exactly. Yeah. So, so this is as a time idealistic. when... idealistic... Yeah, so European empires are carving out places. I mean, for example, in the British Empire, you have Rhodesia coming up. Uh, you have uh, the French in West Africa, etc. The Belgians, uh, it, we need to not think of as the Belgians, we need to think of rather as King Leopold II of the Belgians, who, um, with the support of the international community, basically ends up stitching together a bunch of really kind of uh, slapdash sort of acquired bits of territory, which add up to a huge domain in Central Africa, into what he calls the Congo Free State. Not a colony, officially, not a Belgian colony at all, officially, uh, and instead a free state dedicated to two forms of freedom, one of them free trade, and the other one freedom from slavery. Um, now, it's amazing to me, but I think deeply telling, that this place, which was heralded as the kind of new way forward for the non-European or the African world as this wonderful like experiment of the civilizing mission turns out to be the most brutal, the most violent, the most kind of rapacious and extractive of imperial and settings. Conrad feels this from the minute he arrives. He's, he, he's horrified on, on his march. In yeah, I mean, he gets, he gets a sort of early taste of it. You know, it's a, it's a vast domain. I mean, it's the size of you know, more or less Western Europe. Um, and he, there's a tiny number of whites there, heavily armed, uh, and also armed with this incredibly sort of racist uh, vision of what they're going to be doing there. Uh, and so he marches to the place where he's going to get his river steamer. Um, and as he goes up the rapids of the Congo River on foot with porters who are carrying their stuff, sometimes carrying them, you know, over this very uh, uh, difficult landscape, um, he sees the signs of violence all around him. You know, a people are getting chained up on a on a, on on a, a cross. Yeah, on a cross. Dead he, bodies, sees, he sees dead bodies. He sees Africans shot. Wounds. Right. He sees, of course, this labor regime. You know, uh, I mean, we talk about, or the people then would talk about empire building. The people who did the building were forced labor. In the case of Congo, you know, who were carrying all the stuff and the people and so forth. And this is what he sees. And it's I mean, it's very different from what he had seen in, say, Singapore or Borneo. Um, but there are, there, there are a couple of similarities, and I think that this is also what makes Heart of Darkness so fascinating, which he will end up writing, of course, about this experience, um, is that he, in the process of going up and down this river, he sees this sort of system of European trading stations, which are, again, deeply hypocritical, very violent, uh, extractive, rapacious places. Um, and, but as he sees it, he is somebody who has already been to Borneo, who has already seen Europeans in some of these situations, has already sort of thought about, as we know from his writing, um, thought about this kind of sense of the journey into somewhere and the journey out of somewhere. And I think that it helps, the fact that he had already had these kinds of prior experiences, I think helps account for the fact that when he does write about Congo in Heart of Darkness, 
he will, on the one hand, be extremely precise about the setting. He kept a journal of his journey. We can see point by point places where he wrote about the journey uh, in the novel. And yet he also overlays onto it this kind of universalizing storyline, right? And it's a universalizing storyline that he has concocted by himself, I think, having sort of, as it were, layered his own experiences. And the genius move, I think, of Heart of Darkness is that it's not just a story up and down a river in Africa, Africa which is never named, incidentally, in the text. It's a journey in and out of the Thames. And it's that kind of linking together of the different sites in the geography of what we now call globalization that Conrad, I think quite uniquely for the period, brings to the page. And when he's traveling up river, he already has his first novella on the go. Almir, an early version of Almir's follow, uh, Folly uh, is, is, is with him on the steamship. Yeah, a very good example of this layering. So while he's going up the Congo, we know he's keeping this journal, the only one he ever kept, by the way, on his travels that we know of. Uh, but he also has this manuscript of this novel that he's begun to write, uh, or probably earlier that year. And how old is and he now? He is uh, in his mid 30s, yeah, 33, 4 at this time. Uh, and so he's writing this novel in English and he brings the manuscript with him. And it's fascinating to go back to that manuscript and then to see the places in the chapter that we know that he wrote when he came back from Congo, these sorts of accountings of the river that he describes in Almer's Folly, a river in Borneo. And he is, meanwhile, learning how to navigate the Congo River and keeping this journal of point by point, you know, here are the shoals, and here's where you need to avoid the branch. So you know, in somebody's imagination, things can be kind of blended together, even when we later see them on the page in different places. Kids of my generation growing up watching Apocalypse Now, then finding, uh, going to Conrad via via uh, the, the Colonel Kurtz uh, on, on screen, very much grew up with Conrad as this sort of, uh, as this visionary novelist who saw and wrote about things that other British novelists didn't write about, who was aware of the cruelties of imperialism and, and was way ahead of, of so many of his contemporaries. But that's not often how he's seen in Africa, is it? Uh, Achebe wrote a, a very damning essay about Heart of Darkness where he paints Conrad as an out and out racist. Well, it's not only how he's seen perhaps in Africa, but also how he's seen by many people in, in the UK or the US or, or all over the world today. And again, we need to hold competing realities, right? I mean, this is a white man working in the pinnacle of uh, British imperial, European imperial power. Um, and yet, uh, and, and a white man who is, among other things in Heart of Darkness, using Africa as a backdrop against which to launch a bigger meditation on civilization versus savagery, right? That is a trope that clings to Africa to this day. It's a trope that Conrad absolutely participates in, and it's a trope in which African figures, as Achebe famously pointed out, have no uh, speaking power. That is all true of Conrad. Conrad is also, however, meditating on civilization and savagery in a way that questions uh, the, the value of so-called European civilization, that recognizes the hypocrisy uh, that is embedded within it, and that challenges all of the kinds of truisms at the time that were thrown out about progress and improvement and so on. So Conrad is able, in a sense, to do both of these things, to be someone who is not you know, bringing Africans onto the page. Um, although, incidentally, I would also point to the fact that today we, also, we, we would also question the ability of anyone to enter into the heads of somebody different from them, right? I mean, all of the discussion of cultural appropriation, I think, hinges on exactly this. Uh, so he doesn't bring Africans onto the page, but he does bring a certain set of dynamics onto the page, which I think are, first of all, highly resonant for uh, eras beyond, uh, and second of all, were uh, uh, quite uh, striking and distinctive even in his own time, and allow him to be this kind of um, uh, unusual, quite distinctive voice on the, uh, the writing and the, the imaginary of empire uh, in that book. We're running towards the end of the session, just to kind of speed forward. So he leaves Africa on the verge of a nervous breakdown, goes off to Switzerland to try and recover, and then sort of the most bizarre period of his life ends up in the home counties, um, uh, living in Kent somewhere, becoming very English and hobnobbing with, all the, with Henry James. Uh, how does he make that transition? 
from the sailor up the Congo to the kind of to the beloved English novelist. Yeah, I mean, he makes it partly by working really hard at writing, and he writes every day, and he gets this novel done, and then he gets it. He makes it partly by uh, a literary uh, economy in which this is possible. He sends his novel. Uh, off to Fisher Unwin, uh, and they publish it, and uh, and then he writes another one, and they publish that, and he kind of ticks along. Um, I would add, by the way, speaking of uh, technological change or economic change, he's writing, he's one of the last generation of English writers who writes in serial, uh, and so he publishes in serial in the newspapers and magazines, and of course you get income from doing that as well. Um, you get income from it, and I think it also accounts for some of the pace of productivity of many of the writers of that period, who would often produce a major novel every year. Dickens, uh, Wilkie Collins. Exactly, yeah. uh, and Conrad's great uh, uh, acquaintance, uh, one of the most popular novelists of that time, H.G. Wells, is of course enormously prolific uh, as well. So Conrad is writing in that economy, uh, and he, uh, in a, in a move that we, I mean, we just don't have enough sort of documentation to explain. Um, but he ends up marrying a young girl from, I mean, a teenager from South London, uh, um, and uh, from Peckham, uh, English girl, uh, and uh, they get married. It's a happy marriage. Uh, many people ultimately are very, many people in Conrad's circle are very disdainful of her because they see her as, oh, she's not intellectual, she's not, you know, sort of a salon person, she's not upper class, etc. But it's a quite happy and supportive marriage. Conrad has been um, living in a world without women. Exactly. And so he has this sudden sort of shift into kind of domesticity, which he's never had in his life. And his books are fairly unpeopled by women. They're very, they're, it's a male dominated. Yes, you know, there's a lot of attention that has been paid uh, to the absence of African characters in Heart of Darkness in particular. Uh, if you think about the writing of that period and the, the kind of conventions of fiction in that period, the far more striking absence in Conrad's work um, is really prominent female characters. Now, of course, he has female characters. Of course, he has some novels, particularly toward the end of his career, with more significant female characters. The Secret Agent features, uh, for example, a very prominent female character. But if you compare to some of the other major, Henry James, for example, right? It's a very different kind of imagination. And one of the other features of Conrad's literary career is that he was critically acclaimed but not commercially successful. Does that sound familiar uh, to any writers uh, of this day and age? Uh, and H.G. Wells said to him, well, it's because you make no concessions to women readers. You know, you need to get women in your books and then, and then and you'll see. And by this more. stage also, he's being massively read in America. He's going on book tour. He is by the end. I mean, yeah. he has a late, the story of Conrad is a story of late blooming. Uh, he writes his best known works uh, in, a, in a wonderfully fruitful period between about 1895 and 19, 1907, 1897, 1907. It's only in oh, the 1910s that he will then become commercially successful, partly through clever publishing. Um, and, and largely the books that we don't read today. And largely the books we don't read today. Uh, it's another of these anomalies about Conrad, maybe the one I, we should perhaps wrap up on, is that this is a man who, at the beginning of his writerly career, is experimenting with form and narrative in an incredible way. And this is why he is seen as a proto-modernist, exploding some of the conventions of linear narrative and unitary perspective and so on. By the end of his writing life, he is actually writing in what we would consider now to be sort of more... Uh, conventional forms of the kind of adventure romance or yeah. something, with much less shifting of perspective, with much less chronological uh, twists and turns, with much more one sort of... One novel with a woman on the cover. Yes, yes, well, that's the one that really sort of breaks through. And so you find him in the 1920s when, you know, Ulysses is being written and Mrs. Dalloway and so on. Here's Conrad writing these things like The Arrow of Gold, which I... Uh, urge you never to read. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a really, again, a, one of these interesting turns that here is someone who has been really avant-garde in certain ways, who then later in life ends up writing, but being commercially successful at it. And Virginia Woolf is very about it, doesn't she? Yeah, so Virginia Woolf in an obituary, Conrad died in 1924, at a time when he was very successful in America, he had finally become commercially successful. Um, and was, you know, very crit critically acclaimed by a Cover handful of Time of magazine. He was on the second issue ever of Time magazine, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, in the UK, uh, you know, regarded well and so on, and yet, you know, his friends noted, how come so few people were at his funeral? How come this wasn't, like, a really big deal? Virginia Woolf writes an obituary, praising him in many ways, but also saying, look, you know, he basically writes books for boys, uh, and he was a stranger in our midst, uh, 
uh, you know, always sort of elusive, and this foreigner who, you know, is a, is a boy's own novelist. So why, why was she wrong? Why should we read Conrad today? Why is, why is he an important figure? Well, I think that for, for many of the reasons we've touched on, I think Conrad was a person who, as I say, he was a product of and a witness to a moment in globalization. And therefore, as we live through a moment of globalization right now, I think he has particular resonance in this moment. I also think that he uh, is a person who genuinely did, as Henry James said, bring to the page a more uh, diverse and striking and unusual assortment of characters into the British domestic world. This is another thing people said of Heart of Darkness. No one has ever brought home to England the stories from these places. And I think that today, as we reflect a lot on where, as they did then, on where the borders are, where are the boundaries on the map between people, uh, between ideas, where are the borders? Conrad is a really interesting person through whom to think about this. He's someone who gives us, I think, a cultural history of globalization to remind us that we're not coming at this for the first time. We don't have to agree with everything he did. We don't have to love everything he stood for. But we can still find in him, as we do in all the history I think we study, valuable mirrors, uh, precedents, and lessons for the time in which we find ourselves now. Final question, since this is an, uh, an Indian festival. Um, Naipaul had very complicated feelings about Conrad, didn't he? But he said that he was someone who'd been wherever he went before him. Are the two very similar figures in some ways? I think in certain ways. I mean, Conrad, uh, I mean, Naipaul also, of course, is somebody who is, in his case, a product of diaspora, who then uh, reflects on the, as it were, originary countries of, of his ethnic origins and his, uh, the imperial history. Uh, he's somebody who, um, I think, Could also be like of Conrad, racism in Africa. Well, absolutely. I was going to get to that as my <laughs> third point, but he's certainly somebody who uh, is, you know, wildly racist in various ways, uh, but is somebody, too, who's very interested in kind of being uh, kind of forensic about that. Um, and, I mean, in this way, he's obviously of a different generation from Conrad because in a sense I think he looks at this cultural difference, ethnic difference, racial difference, and he says, you know, I hate these people, but why? And then he gets into it. And I think uh, Naipaul is one in a line of authors uh, who have been able to keep reinventing Conrad uh, for our own times. They're also both properly global figures, aren't they? They, they, they span the globe in their, in their Writing. Yeah, I mean, global, very few... global is a word that I always sort of, um, I use, we all use it in the academy these days, but it's a word that one always sorts of, sort of twitches over because Naipaul, for example, is operating in an Anglophone global world, right? But, but yes, I mean, he's absolutely a transcontinental figure. He's writing about South America, he's writing about Africa, he's writing about Asia, he's writing about uh, the Caribbean, Europe, et cetera, North America. Uh, and Conrad, too. And there are many, many of these sorts of people. You know, we are in a world of interconnection. And I think that looking at the imaginative uh, output of people who have reflected on these sorts of collisions and transitions and encounters uh, can be immensely uh, rewarding. Time for maybe one or two questions before we... No, no. Yeah. I've been... Uh, longing to ask you because novels set on ships such as Moby Dick or Sacred Hunger or Heart of Darkness, they of course have no women yeah. set in those times. So what I wanted to know was had you been able to relate to Conrad's writing in the Heart of Darkness when you read him as a girl, when did you become fascinated by him as a writer? I first read Conrad in 11th grade English, and I read Lord Jim, and I just found it to be unlike anything I had ever read. And the reason was, and this is actually something I see among my own students now, Lord Jim is about a young man who is going out into the world full of dreams and hopes, and then finds himself in a critically uh, uh, challenging position and goes in a completely different direction. And I think at the age of 16, you know, that's just not a kind of storyline that I was familiar with. And again, I see in my own students, they also are kind of captivated by that. To be honest, the idea that I would or wouldn't relate to a book with a male versus a female character didn't, I don't think it quite struck me. I mean, of course, I can see in retrospect, and I see in my reading now, that I was, 
you know, very taken with the, with the Brontes, for example. But I loved Dickens. Dickens is not known for his strong women characters. It was More only, than Conrad. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm down on Dickens' as women. But, um, but, but it was only later, for example, that I found Trollope, who had much more humane women, et cetera. So, I mean, I suppose that I would add, so I'd say that, first of all, I found things in Conrad to relate to anyway. Second of all, it was perhaps only a second order question to me to think about the absences, though I then, of course, did. But third of all, doesn't that say something important about the way that we read? Because I think that the way that we read is at once very much determined by our own subject positions. We do, of course, look for perspectives and voices that we can relate to. But then isn't reading also about getting perspectives we don't know? And isn't that, after all, what I think for me drew me into studying history, drew me into these kinds of works of fiction to begin with? So, um, so I tend to resist the idea that, that, that one should uh, that that Conrad is a man's writer. Are you uh, are you a believer that uh, no, are you not a no, Conradian? I mean, not necessarily, or? but yeah. I was yeah. Yes. Uh, can be attributed to the fact that he had no women characters and therefore no, uh, you know that A. G. Wells told him yes. put in women. Exactly. Get a well, I mean, readership. I think, you know, I don't, I'm not a publisher, so I don't know all the ins and outs of it. I mean, I do think marketing obviously has something to do with all of this. Um, I'm, I don't believe that, that all readers are equally happy to read the same sorts of things. And I think we can tell from, well, I don't know. Again, I don't want to speak out of turn about publishing dynamics. But I would say that manifestly, there are readers who like to read about figures who to whom they feel they can relate. I mean, the idea of relatability is obviously very important for many people in reading and uh, what they consume. Time for one more? At the back. So, thank you. Um, so, during the period that Conrad is writing in, and also in the sort of following decades, a lot of modernist writers like him, are very mobile figures. I mean, a book was written by Terry Eagleton, which he titled Exiles and Emigres. So you've got Jean Rhys, you've got Joyce. I mean, all of them, in, in different ways, operate at the intersection of these different cultures, these different ethnicities, these different worlds. And so I'm, like, I would like to know, what is it that is distinctive about Conrad in, in, the, in, in this sense? So first I would say that Conrad is a ge good generation before some of those other figures. I mean, he's definitely, uh, you know, he's, he's born in 1857. I mean, this is a mid-Victorian figure uh, in many ways. Second of all, I would say that Conrad is writing in his non-native language. I mean, he's writing Polish as his first language, then French. He learns English only as an adult. Uh, third of all, I would say that Conrad's experience of the world puts him into uh, far, uh, uh, he, he's put into conversation with a wider array of different cultures than, say, Joyce is. Uh, so those are some just sort of biographically distinctive facts uh, about him. Uh, now, manifestly, uh, English writing, Eng that is, writing in the English language, is a writing that is rich, particularly in the 20th century, uh, and now the 21st, with figures who are coming at it uh, from other, uh, from, from not from the home counties. Um, but I also, I guess I would finally say that, um, you know, this is a, again, I don't want to speak out of turn, but one could, one could question something here about the canonical, or rather the, the writers who attract literary critical acclaim as opposed to the other writers. So if you were to look at a list of, say, best-selling authors, through the 19th century into the 20th century, even into today, my hunch would be that until fairly recently, most of those would have been much more homegrown writers. Uh, and that some of these more, if you will, writing from the periphery figures who are in the case of Joyce or in the case of say Oscar Wilde or in the case of, uh, of Naipaul later or Jean Reese are coming you know, from more peripheral fig uh, positions. Those are the ones who are taken up in, you know, with and great academic. alacrity in academic circles and for very good reason. I mean, I don't think these are, I'm not trying to pass judgment on it, but I just, I think that Conrad for his time is highly unusual.